of gold and glory. Praise God. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10. We've finished the series and we've got a couple of um, other things going on over these next weeks. But I want to preach this morning a standalone message, a single message, which has been rolling with me for a few weeks now. And uh, I want to bring it to you from Hebrews chapter 10. And this is what I have called this message, a message for the hour. That is my title. And I believe what I'm going to read to you embodies that. Here you have an individual verse in Hebrews chapter 10. And I actually believe it is a message for this hour. Someone online is going to see this title. I, I told Candice, it's a bit of a deceptive title. Because someone online later this week is going to read this title, A Message for the Hour. And they're going to want to watch it and listen to it. And they're going to be gripped and say, I want to know God's message for the hour. But they're not going to want to hear what I say in this message. They want that title, but they don't want what I'm going to say in it. And I sure hope everyone here is not so impressed with a title to go, that sounds intriguing and fascinating. And it sounds like it's prophetic, and it is. It's all those things. But yet when you get inside it and find out what the Bible says, you go, oh, is that all? And I'm telling you, carnal flesh will say that. This world will say that, religion will say that, a Christian could never say that. And so I do, forgive me for having to say it, I've got a bit of a deceptive title to get you inside. A message for the hour, for this hour, very specifically. And yet when we get inside it, it is something that we preach year in, year out, and we live out on a regular basis. And yet I believe the power of the message God has for this hour. It actually is one of the most neglected of this precise hour. Let's read the word of God here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. But let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as ye see the day approaching. That's my verse. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we do thank you for the word of God, that it is a living book. It is like a sword that divides between soul and spirit. Nor God, it deals with the heart. It goes right inside the very motives, the thoughts, the intentions of our inward man. And the truth of God can only divide between these things. It, it's like a knife cutting between the bone uh, marrow and the flesh of the body. And Lord God, we thank you for the truth of God's word. We thank you in a simple verse like this. We have an actual prophetic, thus saith the Lord, message for the church of this hour, for every believer and every individual. My God, I thank you that the Spirit of God speaketh unto the church. We're not playing religion. We're not playing religious games. We believe in a real God that knows our hearts. We believe in a, that we're in an hour where our entire world is radically changing and we're asking come Lord Jesus we are looking earnestly for your coming my God you commanded us and instructed us that we are to earnestly seek and look and wait to God and desire for your coming again even so come Lord Jesus will you bless us and speak to each one in this room nor God all those online that, that are elsewhere and those that will listen this message later, we do bless you and love you this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. My message, a message for the hour. 
I believe Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and let me say it again, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as, and notice this line, as ye see the day approaching. That's why I've called this a message for the hour, for this hour. Very exactly. Do you know why? It says, as ye see the day approaching. What day is it talking about? The day of the Lord, Jesus coming again, of the end of church history, of the hour that all of the Bible speaks about. It says, as ye see a particular day. Notice it says, the day. It's a specific, certain hour and day. It's not talking about a generation. It's talking about a day. As you see. Do you know what? You ought to be able to see the approach of the coming of the Lord. You ought to be able to discern and tell and see that it's right on the horizon. I'm not talking about something a mile away or five miles away or a hundred miles away. I'm talking about something just on the horizon that you can see with your eyes. I'm not talking about your natural physical eyes. I'm talking about your spiritual eyes. I'm talking about the eyes of your mind and your heart, that when you begin to look at our world, what's happening in 2021, right at this very time, you can actually see a certain day approaching very fast. What is that day? Jesus is coming back. It is the day of the Lord. Listen, just before in the previous chapter, it says in Hebrews chapter 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we see that just before what he says here in Hebrews 10, he was talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice he's only coming for those looking for him. If you're not looking for him coming back, you're in trouble this morning. If you're not living like he's coming back, if you're living like a sinner, if you're living like the world, if you're living as if he is never going to come back, and yet in your mind you say, oh, I believe it, and I believe the Bible, and I believe it's real, and yet you don't see it. Oh, I know it, but do you see it? I mean, are your eyes open? You see, in Hebrews 9 it says, unto them that look for him. Are you eagerly looking for the second coming of the Lord? Then it says in Hebrews 10, 25, as ye see the day approaching, there are certain things that are going to impact your life. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus, you're actually looking for him to come back again. In fact, it's one of your chief desires. There's those in the church are terrified Jesus will come back. And if I was them, I would be terrified. There's lots of preachers who would be scared if Jesus would come back. You see, you can preach things and believe things and talk about things as long as they're far enough away. Oh, I believe all these things. Oh, I believe there's a real hell. I believe there's a heaven. I believe God is real. I believe certain things. But don't let it get too close. You see, Matthew 10, sorry, Hebrews 10, 25 is for those. There's instruction for those who see the day is approaching. In other words, it's coming like this. The day of the Lord of his return is approaching. It's getting very, very close. And if you can see, if you can discern, if you understand with your mind and your heart that that day is coming in very, very close, it's going to impact your life. There's certain things in this verse that says you ought to do more than in any other generation. I mean more than any church or Christian uh, individuals for 1900 years. If you really believe prophecy is being fulfilled and Jesus is coming and these are the last days, there's things you should emphasize in your life more than anybody of any previous generation since the apostles. I mean, this ought to be something that's gripping you. Do you see why I say this is a message for the hour, but very unpalatable for this hour and generation? 
people don't like the box. They like presents. They like Christmas. They like to open it. They like the ribbon. They like the paper. They like the excitement. Then they open it and go, oh, have you ever given a present like that? You give it in the utter disappointment. Some are rather good at pretending, but there's always one. And he goes, oh, I believe there's a lot in the church. They open it and go, oh, preach this about Antichrist. Preach on the four horses of the apocalypse, man. But don't preach on Hebrews 10.25. This is a message for the hour. It says in 1 John 2 and 28, and now little children, abide in him. Stay in him. Stay in the Lord Jesus Christ. You little children that claim to be children of God. Everyone isn't a child of God. I know that's popular to say, oh, we're all children of God. No, we are not. Not if you read the Bible. Not if you believe what Paul says and Peter and John and Jesus. You're not all children of God. But if you are a child of God, it says, abide in him. If you say you're a child of God, then abide in him. Oh, I'm trying. No, it says abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence or boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You see, if you don't abide in Christ and walk in Christ and live in Christ and obey Christ, you will be ashamed when he appears. If you disobey knowingly, if you live your own life, if you claim Christ and yet do not obey Christ, you will be ashamed. You're going to be terrified on the day that Jesus Christ appears. In fact, he'll come as a thief in the night for you. He's not coming as a thief in the night for me. I'm going to have no shock, no surprise. It's only those walking in darkness it's going to surprise them. But it says those walking in light. He doesn't come as a thief in the night. He doesn't come suddenly and unexpectedly. You know what? I'm going to expect him if I'm walking in the light. My eyes are open. I'm going, that day is approaching. Make sure everything is really in order. You will be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I love him. I desire him. I long for him. A message for the hour. Let me preach to you from these few verses that we read. I've got three points here. The Lord's house, the Lord's day, and the Lord's people. Notice that. The Lord's house, the Lord's day, and the, day, and the Lord's people. And it's all in the context of a message for this hour, for the church of this hour, for everyone who claims to know Christ. If you're born again and know Jesus, if you say you have been birthed of God or you're a child of God, this is for you. In fact, this is very much for you more than anyone in this city. My first point, the Lord's house. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, 21. And having an high priest over the house of God. What a beautiful scripture. That's my first point. The Lord's house. There is something called the Lord's house. What is a house? It's where you live. Where you live. Where you eat. Where you sleep. Where you dwell. Where you relax. Where you entertain your friends. Notice here, it's not a man's house. It's not a preacher's house. It's not a church's house, not a ministry's house. It is actually called the house of God. And it says specifically about God's house that God's house has a high priest over it. Remember all you Catholics that as a Catholic, you'd go into that little box and you'd confess your sins. Those guys were often, no, not always, were more wicked than you. And as soon as you walked out, you go, I feel so much better. Well, you always do when you share a burden. No wonder you feel better. And you go out, and within 12 hours, you're as bad as anyone. But we're told in the Bible, a real Christian has a high priest. Not a human priest. Not a human ministry. But the real house of God, how do you know it? It has a high priest over it. And we know that his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is over the house of God. In other words, he watches over it. He tells you what to do inside it. He sets it in order. He is the boss man. Do you understand that? Jesus Christ is the boss of God's house. Now, if you go somewhere and Christ isn't the high priest, 
an awful lot of Christians that don't even, they haven't even studied the high priestly ministry of Christ. It means nothing to them. What a tragedy. The real house of God has a high priest. And in fact, you can't function unless you enjoy this ministry. He is more important to me as my high priest than a priest down the road is to a Catholic. I know Catholics, some of you have mothers or fathers, and every single day they go to Mass in the Catholic chapel. Every single day, for decades, for a lifetime, they've gone in, taken the Mass, which they say becomes the body of Christ. That's heresy. That's an abomination. That's a denial of the finished work of Christ. But they go in there and look at them. They rely on that priest. That priest is their life. They rely on that priest saying, your sins are forgiven you. They depend on his words. They depend on his person. They depend on his presence. And they always go to what they claim to be the house of God. What a tragedy. You know what it says here in Hebrews? And having a high priest over the house of God. Aren't you glad you have a great high priest? He is perfect. He is sinless. He is mighty. He is faithful. He is gracious. You know, earlier in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, even Christ Jesus. You're to consider him. You're to stop and to gaze at Jesus as your high priest. Has he forgiven you? Has he said, I forgive you, go and be free? Have you experienced the power of his ministry to wash you and make you clean? Do you stop and gaze at him and look at him? I'm not talking about Christ on the cross. I'm talking about your great high priest at the right hand of the Father. He is ever praying for you. He is standing there now. He's constantly watching over the house of God. He has an entire ministry that he is carrying on. And you know what? You cannot live your Christian life without him. If you're ignorant of his high priestly ministry, if you don't know he is the high priest of the house of God, how can you be in the house of God if you don't know he's the high priest over the house? You cannot function in the house of God. What is the house of God? He is talking about a body of people that gather together. That's what the house of God is. It is the church. It is the gathering of real Christians. Or as it says in Hebrews 10:25. The assembling of ourselves together. That is the house of God. He says that in 25, but previously in verse 21, he's saying Christ is the high priest over the house. He's watching over it. Then it goes on in chapter 3 and 2. Speaking of Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful what Moses was to Israel in the Old Testament, to the tabernacle, to the house of God. Moses was very, very faithful. He was. We, we, I, I assure you, you and I would not have been faithful to Israel like Moses was. We wouldn't. We would have said, Lord, destroy them and start with me and you. He pleaded. He interceded. He stood. But God says, I'm going to destroy them and start with you again, Moses. He said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Your character, your promise, your covenant. He began to plead. Do you know Christ is far more faithful than Moses? I mean far more. Christ himself stands between you and hell. That's how faithful he is. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. In so much as he who had builded the house hath more honor than the house. This is not about a church. It's not about numbers. It's not about activities. It's not about reputation. It's not about wealth. It's not about the building. It's not about your bank account in the church. Do you know what it's about? It's about Christ, the high priest. You know, all of you, you that are visiting here this morning, I do have something for you. It's got nothing to do with this preacher or this building or this people. Absolutely not. But we do have a great high priest over this house. I know that he's here. That's why sitting around you are those that were drug addicts and alcoholics and atheists and evolutionists and all manners of person who used to sell drugs in this building who used to um, lead people in worship, 
to a false god in this very building and yet they're washed in the blood of the lamb do you know what they met the great high priest it's a reality that's what we have in this church this is the lord's house this here is the lord's house our gathering this morning all that we've done this is the lord's house and you know what we have a high priest over the house it goes on in chapter 3 and it says in verse 6 but christ as a son over his own house whose house are we he's the high priest well who are we you're his house you're the house of the lord jesus christ as we gather we are the dwelling place for the lord jesus then notice the next statement whose house are we if there's a lot of people who've walked through this church and a few who have listened online and they don't like it when i say if they say we wish you wouldn't say if and you make us feel bad and insecure we feel like you're speaking this like we're not christians or something do you ever hear the saying in life if the hat fits i'm just preaching the word of god i don't have any other right you deal with god if your conscience condemns you you need to deal with that if your heart goes amen praise god he says okay you're god's house if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end you are god's house if you're holding fast oh i can live anyway but i'm saved oh i believe that i'm saved by grace through faith i believe in him but it doesn't matter how i live who told you that it's all through the church of the state but they didn't get it from the bible they didn't get it from christ he is the high priest over the house he tells us how this house operates do you know what he says you are we are the house of god if we hold fast are you holding fast your confidence are you casting it aside are you rejoicing in your hope firm unto the end f is a big word i got saved by grace i'm not trying to be saved i'm not trying to keep myself saved i'm not looking to myself for this you know what i'm kept by the power of god through faith i don't have any fear of falling away you know what i have a high, a great high priest over the house you know what i've got no fears of backsliding or falling away but if one thought comes into my mind say sure let it all go sure you'll be okay i tremble you know why that's a voice of hell speaking whispering if you don't know that or else it's your flesh that's saying sure you're okay you'll be fine you believe in god you had an experience what and you think you can live anyway in the house of god if you live in the house of god you live according to the headship of that house who is the lord it says in hebrews 4 seeing that we have a high priest or because of this jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession hold it fast for we have a high priest which can we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities or our weaknesses but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need do you know what this great high priest he knows your struggles he knows temptation he knows what you fight he's not ignorant of any of it he fully understands and if you come on to him he'll give you grace don't run and live your own life run to him if he is your great high priest dwell in the house of god and go to him for mercy i need help do you know who the weakest man in this room is do you know who the very weakest man is it's not you do you know who the weakest person is in this room it's not you it's the preacher stand before you i will fight and argue with you i am front of the line i am the weakest man you'll ever meet but i do have a secret the lord jesus christ he is my strength i don't have any other power i don't have anything else to boast in it says again in hebrews chapter 8 now the things which we have spoken this is the sum eight chapters so what's the sum of eight chapters in hebrews this is it we have such a high priest the entire book of hebrews is about the high priest over the house of god who you are 
if you're the church, then you are God's house. He is the high priest over it. He watches over it. That's my first point here. The Lord's house, a message for this hour. We are the Lord's house. We have a high priest who's over it. It's an extraordinary ministry. The second point, the Lord's day, the Lord's house, the Lord's day. It says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's break this down for a moment. This is my second point, the Lord's day, the Lord's house, the Lord's day. It talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What does it mean to forsake the assembling together? And remember, this is the teaching of Christ to the church. This is the master of the house saying, this is how we operate. If you're a child, if you're in the house, this is how we function. This is a command for this hour. Do you believe it's the last days? Do you believe prophecies being fulfilled? Do you believe that day's coming in very, very fast? Then this promise is for you, this command, this teaching. Do not forsake assembling together. This word forsake means to leave behind in some other place while you go and do your own thing. It's talking about the gathering of the church, of Christians together. So you let the church gather together in the same place at the same time to do the same thing. What do you do? You leave it behind and you go off to do your own thing. This word forsaken means to desert or to abandon. It means to neglect. It means to deliberately separate yourself from the gathering of God's house. In other words, you neglect the gathering, but you also neglect your responsibilities in that gathering. We are given a clear command. If you believe this is the last hour, I believe this is God's message for this hour. I believe the church around the world needs to hear this loud in their ears. Do not forsake gathering in the house of God. Do not desert it. Do not leave it and go off as an individual. There should never be a Christian isolated through choice. You see, I know watching on that camera, there's a lot of people right across this world. I know that. And I'm not talking about them. You know what? They can't find a church in their area. Apostasy, false teaching, and abuse has swept what's called the church. Some of the men in the pulpits are worse than any sinner on the streets of Limerick. It's an abomination. I wouldn't listen to a man like that. I wouldn't stay in that church. And I understand why there's people out there. They cannot hardly find a church. They could be in a city and they search looking for a simple church, a basic church, a Bible-believing church, a blood-washed church, a spirit-led church, just a simple gathering of believers. That's all they want. Not a big building, not a big paycheck, not a big reputation. But where can I find the house of God where Christ is the high priest? Where can I find it? And you know what? As they search, it's very, very hard. I'm not talking about those that are longing for the house of God, that would do anything to be here gathered with us this morning. I'm not talking about that. Do you know what this word says? It is for this hour. If this was written 2,000 years ago, and it says, as you see that day approaching, gather all the more. Mm -hmm. Do you realize it's for this hour? The past year and a half, never in 2,000 years have we had, in 2,000 years, a time where in all nations the church is shut down, or almost all the churches. Never in world history has that once happened before. Never. But the past year and a half, churches right across nations in every country, they shut their doors, stop gathering together. Don't tell me that this word is not for this hour and this time. This is a scripture. It is a word from the Lord for this hour. Do not forsake the assembling together. You know, over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 10, this same word is used. For Demas has forsaken me. Oh, he's still there in spirit, brother Paul. He's still for you. He still believes in you. 
He's still got thoughts in his mind. I can imagine Demas writing a letter and saying, Brother Paul, God bless you. I'm with you in spirit. I'd hate to hear the response. It says, for Demas had forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he is departed unto Thessalonica. Why did he leave to make a journey to another city, to Thessalonica? Because he loved this world. He made the decision to move away from Paul, to go to Thessalonica. Why did he do that? How did he make his decision? He loved this world. He really loved the things of this world. Do you know how many claim Christians in the church make decisions because they love the world? They actually love this world. Not God's kingdom, not Christ, not God's house, certainly. But they love this world and they make decisions to leave the preaching of the word of God a ministry raised up of God, and they moved to another place. Well, Paul exposes it here. He says, he forsook me. Demons can say all he wants. He says, my spirit's with Paul. Oh, yes, I care about brother Paul. You have forsaken. Your actions reveal your heart. Your decisions reveal your heart. I know what I'm talking about. And I know this book. I want to assure you. It says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This assembling of ourselves together, do you know what it means in the Greek? It's profound. It means a complete collection in one place. That's what the assembling is. Oh, well, half of us will stay at home and half of us will come. That is not an assembling of the local church. You see, when you assemble yourselves together, it's a complete collection in one place. That is God's will. This same word is only used in one other place in the New Testament, and it's the noun form of it. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. The term gathering together in 2 Thessalonians is talking about when Jesus comes. When he comes, all of us worldwide and every nation will gather unto him. You know what that word means? To assemble together means we're going to be gathered in one place, the same place, around the same person at the same time. You can't make it mean anything else. It's only used twice in the Bible. Once of us gathering in the house of God, the other time is to gather to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you, if you don't have enough of the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the grace of God, and the power of God in your life, to gather as the body of Christ. How do you ever expect to gather unto Christ when He comes? Also, the verb of this word is used. It's just written slightly different in the Greek. It's used six times, beginning with Matthew 24, 31, when it talks about us gathering to the Lord Jesus when He comes back. And so we see this is the Lord's day. We gather at the same time in the same place in the same meetings all together. And you're given a command. Do not forsake gathering together with the people of God. Mm-hmm. Notice what Paul says here in this verse 25. As the manner of some is. He didn't say all or most or half. He said some. Some of those he was writing to. He actually states it here as the manner of some is. He knew under the ministry of Paul, there's some sitting there and they actually have a manner or a habit of not gathering together. The word manner is ethos in the Greek. It means a habit, a practice, a principle, a pattern. Have you met them? In other words, you are accustomed, you're used to doing this. You're convinced that it's right that you can do it. You're a deserter. You know, in the army, when you desert ranks, you're AWOL. Absent without leave. Who gave you permission? Oh, I just felt. The Spirit of God led me. Really? You're absent without leave. I was in the army for five years. You don't walk off that camp. And sergeant says, where are you going? You know, Sergeant, I've been dreaming and thinking. I just feel. He says, son, you're either going in the prison or you're going to get back in the ranks. (laughs) That's what my sergeant would have said. Not today's sergeants. 
Paul is talking about those. It was their custom, their pattern. I mean, it was a part of their thinking, their ideology. They could debate with you over this. Brother, you need to understand this is my manner. I'm different from everyone else in the church. I'm different than you. Brother Keith, you need the church. Obviously, you're not strong enough, but I do not need the gathering of the body of Christ. I don't need to be in regular meetings in the same place at the same time. Why would there be po- uh, people in Paul's day who deserted or went AWOL in the local gathering of the church? What are some of the reasons? Fear and suffering. Do you realize the church in Jerusalem, who Paul wrote to at this time, it was getting close to AD 70. It wasn't quite there. It was in the 60s. Remember, Rome's going to come in and destroy them. In Jerusalem, as a Christian, you're being persecuted. You're suffering. Your family is suffering. Your money is suffering. Your work is suffering. Everything is suffering. That was the condition of it. And so Paul could see that there was some leaving the assembly of God's people and just slipping back into the temple to the back row and saying, now I believe in the Messiah. I believe in Meshiach. I, I believe in the Lord Jesus. But you know what? I'm just staying here. Well, isn't it funny when you go into the temple, your livelihood isn't under threat. You don't get persecuted. You don't have trouble at home. Your father or mother isn't there in your ear or your wife or your husband. So you just slip in. You're getting away from the house of God and you're going into the temple. Why? Because you're scared of persecution. You're scared of suffering. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is deception. If someone says, I don't have a local church, I don't need a local church, I don't need a body. You're deceived, you don't know the Bible. You don't even know basic, understand the scripture. What about lack of maturity in teaching? Yes, it's everywhere. I've met real genuine Christians, really born again, saved out of the world. But they don't know this that I've just told you. They do not know it. They've never heard it. They've never been challenged about it. They're utterly ignorant. It's through lack of maturity. They haven't had time to grow and mature. Or they've been taught the false thing. Or they've listened some YouTube video. Or an entire series of YouTube videos from profit nonsense. And they said, but I I know what the Bible teaches. They haven't read their Bible, they've listened to him. Or maybe unbelief, you know the Bible, you know the word of God, but it's through unbelief and you know it. You know you're not obeying. You know you're not established in the house of God. You know, God never used or trained anyone to serve him or to be used in any great way that never functioned in a local church. Never, never. Not in church history, not in the Bible. God will not use you if you can't function in a local church. We've met them here in Limerick. They come in, saved out of drugs and crime and immorality. A hundred offenses on the record and they're proud of it. They're notorious and they know it. But they go, I'm not coming under any authority. I can just preach on those streets. I don't need to belong anywhere. You ought to run from that type of person. There's something wrong. There's something seriously wrong with that person. When you justify that you're different than everyone else, that a promise or a command like this isn't for you. It's given by Christ, given by the Spirit of God in the Bible, but it's not for you. You've got a real problem. Or maybe it's COVID and lockdowns. Sometimes because of persecution or lockdowns or what's going on, there are times we've had to, against our desire, Things have happened where we're not meeting together. Many across this world, that's how it's been. But you know, increasingly they're going, hold on a second. This cannot go on. We will not tolerate this happening time and time and time again. There's an agenda behind this. And so we see that in Paul's day, it was the manner of some. So what's the other option? What is the option to forsaken the assembly, the regular gathering of God's house and going and doing your own thing. What is the other option? What are you to do? It says, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. That's what we ought to be doing in this church is exhorting one another. This term exhorting one another, it's the ministry of the paraclete. It means that you as an individual, you're meant to do that. It's not my job to do that. 
Oh, Brother Keith, you're meant to exhort us. Yes, but that's not my ministry. It's the church, the assembly. It's your task. You have that calling. You're, you're called to. Don't go and sit by yourself down the road. Actually be in the body of Christ, exhorting one another. The Greek means come alongside someone else. Stand beside them and you begin calling out to them or talking to them. You're standing. You know what? There's a lot of pressure in our world at this time. An awful lot of extreme pressure. People can't find churches. There's COVID. There's the risk of losing jobs. There's the threat medically. All these things are pressing in. Do you know what we need in the church? And it's a word for our hour. Right across the church, we need exhorters in the church. Someone saying, I'm waiting for a vision or a dream or an angel or a great ministry on the high street. Why not exhort in the house of God? It's one of the greatest of ministries to exhort one another. Do you know what? You come alongside your brother or sister and you urge them on. You're exhorting. Do you know what you're saying? Come on, keep going, keep going. When I was in the army, I loved to run. Not so much now. Maybe need to rediscover my running feet again. I loved to run up hills with weight on my back. I loved it. I loved it more than anything else in all the world. I loved to do that. And every year we had annual running tests for all of the squadron. You, you were timed, you had distance, and you had something to fulfill. You had to do it in the time. I knew I could get in within the time. I had no risk of losing out. I wasn't worrying about myself. I'm fit, I can do it. But there's guys there in that squadron. I know they're gonna struggle. It's gonna be touch and go. And if they don't get it, they're on extra running and they're gonna have to do it again. Do you know what I've done with those guys? I come alongside them. I couldn't lift them, hold their arm, I couldn't push them, I couldn't carry them, I wasn't allowed. But I was allowed to come alongside and I'd be running and they're struggling, so I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop, I'm going. No, you're not, no, you're not, keep going. Look, it's only down the road. Well, it's a mile and a half down the road. But I said, you're nearly there. No, I think I'm gonna die, keep going. No, I, I'm not sure I can do this. I'll kick you if you stop. I, I mean, I've done everything. I'm not telling you to do that. I'll kick you if you don't come to me. Don't say that, please. We'll get a reputation. But that's the whole thing, exhorting one another. Do you know you have the same discouragements as me? The same thoughts that I get you have? You, you think I've never been discouraged or depressed or got to the door and said, I can't do this again, or sat there going, I can't pray? See, you think you only go through those things exhorting one another. I walked into meetings and the brothers and sisters have exhorted me. They prayed, they worshiped, they testified, they fellowshiped. It's wonderful and I've got encouraged through it. It says earlier in Hebrews chapter 3, 13, but exhort one another daily yeah. while it is called today. Why do you want this in the church? Lest any one of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know my heart is as prone to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin? Do you know how deceitful sin is? Yeah. Sin comes into your life and it hardens your heart. So you don't feel, you're not worried. You don't think about sin. You go, sure, we're all sinners. Where'd you get that? What verse, what Bible version is that that you find that in? Could you point it out to me? Of course they couldn't. It's just everybody says it. We're all sinners. No one's perfect. What theology are you reading? Do you know in the Bible it says, exhort one another daily. Why? Lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I'm under that danger. You're under that danger. So we exhort one another. Keep going. Keep running. Stay in the house of God. Saints, we're to do this more than at any other time in church history. What is the context of it? It's a gathering of the assembly. Exhort one another about gathering together, walking with God, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Can I ask you, even those that are gonna watch online, can I ask, have we seen a sudden rise in the past year and a half all over this world in the church of a ministry of exhorting one another? Are we hearing what the Spirit of God said as you see that day approaching? You ought to be doing this more than any other time, more than five years ago, more than 
two years ago, more than 10 years ago. We ought to be exhorting. We ought to be gathering all the more like no other time. It's a remarkable thing. You know, I was going to say some things about Sabbath opposed to Sunday, but I'm not going to go there. That would take an entire message. Some people get confused about this specific gathering, the Lord's Day or Sunday. Why do we gather on Sunday whenever the Sabbath was Saturday? And some people on YouTube and elsewhere, I don't have time to go there. I've got an entire message. I could preach for one hour on this one single thing. But I really don't want to, I want to keep it for another time. Enough to tell you the early church in the book of Acts met, guess what? On the first day of the week, Sunday. 1 Corinthians 16, chapter 2. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And Jesus gathered with the disciples on the first day of the week when he rose from the dead. Just enough to say that. I'll come back to that. Because people are asking me online. We'll come back to that another time. So, so important you hear this. Third and finally, the Lord's people, the Lord's house, the Lord's day, we gather together. The Lord's people. I'm keeping this in context of what it says. Look at verse 22. Remember 21 is the high priest over the house of God, who we are. Look at verse 22. Let us. Verse 23, let us. Verse 24, and let us. Between speaking about the high priest over the house and verse 25 where we see that we're not to forsake our gathering together, in between that, three times he gives three specific commands to the Lord's people or to God's people. The Lord's house, the Lord's day, the Lord's people, it is so important here. What is he saying to us? He's not saying to you as an individual. He's saying to us. Do you realize how much teaching in the New Testament is to us? Not to use an individual on how to be saved. It's there. That's what saves you. Being a member of a church does not save you. Gathering regularly in meetings does not save you. But if you're saved and born again, there is a responsibility. It is us. You're not only seeing you as an individual or thinking of your walk, your life before God, your eternity. It now becomes us. Three times the apostle speaks about us. Let me finish here with this simple thing. The Lord's people, the Lord's house, it's his. The Lord's day, it is his. You know about the Lord's day. We've always gathered together here. Some people think of the good of making the rest of the day is theirs. Well, I'll give Sunday to the Lord this week, but you know next week, I'll go up and play football. Whose day is it? It's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. The Apostle Paul spent one week from Monday. He waited for Sunday. You know why? He wanted to break bread with them, preach to them, and be gathered with the entire church. So when he arrived in Troas, on a Monday morning, he had to wait through until Sunday, the first day of the week. He couldn't do it on Wednesday night or Friday night or Saturday. He had to wait till Sunday and the entire church was gathered and they broke bread together. When did they do it? On Sunday. Why didn't they do it Saturday? I think Sunday worship came in with Constantine in the fourth century. Really? It's funny, my Bible doesn't say that. But here, third and finally, the Lord's people. Look at these three commands in verse 22, 23, and 24. First of all, you have in verse 22, intimate fellowship with Christ as an entire body. I thought fellowship was personal and individual. It is, but not in this verse. It's in the context of the gathering of the church. Intimate fellowship with Christ as a body. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near. It's not talking about you in your personal relationship. It's talking about the entire church drawing near unto God. How do we do that? With a true heart. It's God's people together in meetings with a true heart. In other words, their heart is sincere. And it says in full assurance of faith. What is assurance? It is fullness. It is confidence. It is 
to be completely assured or settled. How do you draw near unto God? I am fully settled. Can I ask you as a church, are you fully settled in this gathering this morning? I mean, is your heart, are you drawn near to God in the church? And is it with a true heart? I mean, God looking at your heart. Do you gather to worship him and your heart's true before God? Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what you think. But is your heart true, sincere, genuine, real? Is it open to the word of God? Do you have the full assurance of faith? Not feelings, not thoughts, not circumstance. All your circumstance could be against you or your thoughts or your feelings. But is your heart in full confident assurance? Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, that's the blood of Jesus. How do you approach? How do we approach as God's people? It is through having our hearts sprinkled with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. How do you approach? How do we approach as a church? Having our hearts sprinkled with the precious blood of the Lamb. Have you experienced the blood of Jesus to forgive you? I'm not asking, did you say a sinner's prayer or make a decision? or decide that you believe this. I'm asking, do you approach in the church under God saying my heart has been sprinkled with the blood? Have you had that experience? Has the blood of Jesus washed your heart and now you come with a true heart, you come in the full assurance of faith saying I know I'm forgiven, I know I'm washed in the blood. There's no other way for us to gather as a church. There's people in here, they, they were destroyed by sin. We had no counseling in the church. We had no special backroom ministry in the church. We didn't have secret prophecies to reveal what was holding you back. You know what? I pointed you to the blood of Jesus Christ. It'll save you from drugs and sexual immorality. It'll save you from disobedience and drunkenness and immorality and the things of this world. Isn't it shocking we've got people who love more the things of this world than they do God's house or God's word, but they say, I'm a Christian. You need your heart washed in the blood of the lamb and your bodies washed with pure water. In other words, not just your inward life, your outward life, your body physically, the word of God washing it. The word of God in this Bible setting your outward life in order. So your heart's washed in the blood. Your outward life is according to the word of God and being washed and sanctified. If you're not regularly under the word of God, how are you going to have your life washed with the word of God? Mm -hmm. Secondly, verse 23, the public, your public testimony in the world. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised let us hold fast if continue i can live anyway but i'm in the house are you i can neglect all the commands of scripture but i'm in the house really oh i know jesus will receive me in that day really you don't even know it's approaching because if you knew it's approaching, you want to exhort and gather all the more, more than any time in your life. You're going to be gripped by this. If you're saying, our world's changing. You know what? We need a church that intensifies, turns up the heat. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. What is the profession of your faith? It is your acknowledgement. It is your confession. I'm not talking about positive confession. I'm not talking about just say in the words. I'm talking about out of your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, you go, I have my faith in Christ. I am holding him fast. He is my Lord, my savior. I love him. I obey him. I follow him. I, I will not turn aside. I've got to be in the house of God without any wavering. That means to be tossed about, moved, to keep changing, disputing in your own mind. I don't need to be there in that meeting then you're wavering. Wow. You're actually wavering around. If you bend every direction, your granny comes to lunch, so I won't go to God's house. Why aren't you bringing granny? Oh, she doesn't believe in God. She needs God. You've just told her that she's more important than God. That's what you've just told her. Then what about your kids? 
If a kid dragged me, like Brother Clonen said the other week, if a kid made me leave a convention to go home to deal with them, that, that kid's in trouble. If I have to leave God's house and God's people to deal with that, in serious trouble, there, there's going to be something said. So if you're wavering around, going in every direction, what is the power behind this? He is faithful to promise to you. Why do I hold fast to my profession? I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my entire life. What is the power behind that? He's faithful. He promised. I know if he gives you a command, a command, no matter what it is, the power of God is there. Third and finally, in verse 24, careful ministry in the church. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works. You are commanded in the house of God on the day of the Lord as the Lord's people. You're actually given clear commands. Now I want to tell you something. If you ever meet a Christian and they could care less about these commands, you've got a serious problem on your hands. That person doesn't know Jesus Christ. They don't care about Jesus Christ. They don't love him. What does the Bible say time and time again? Jesus said, if you love me, if again. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can just call it law and push it into the Old Testament or another dispensation and say it's not for us. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't mean that. He would never have said to me if. If you love me, don't worry about all my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do you know what that means? If you don't keep his commands, if you don't desire to, if you don't love to, if you say that's too much, you don't love him. Oh, I do love him. No, what you call love is a sentiment, a feeling. It doesn't affect your life or your speech or your decisions. You don't love him. You're deceived. You're on dangerous ground. You're actually not ready for him to come. The day is approaching and you're blind. You don't even see that he is approaching, that that day is approaching and that you've got to be ready. It says here, consider one another. When you're in the house, you are to consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now, I've met one or two people in the church had a ministry of provoking, but it wasn't this sort of ministry. They love to provoke people. I've seen people actually felt they had an anointing for it, a gifted ministry of provoking. They'd sit in a little living room filled with people and they'd almost say, watch this, as I threw something out. Mm -hmm. I've seen people say, so do you think Melchizedek was Jesus or just a man to young Christians? And not one of those young Christians have a clue what he's talking about. But now they know he knows the answer. They don't know the answer. None of them want to say, what sort of man is that? He's playing games. That's a provoker. But I'm not talking about that. It says, consider one another. Listen to what it says as we close. To observe fully, observe fully everyone around you. Behold them, consider them, discover, perceive. That's what it means to consider one another. Not just those close to you, the entire body. You ought to be watching out for those that are straying or getting misled by sin and you need to exhort them. You need to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. When I say provoke, I mean to stir up the heart of a person. You see them beginning to drift. You see them that they love sin more than the house of God. You see that they don't know the word of God. What I, see, some of you in here, I'm going to provoke you in this message. I'm sorry. I, w I wish it was just a nice, simple exhortation, but I'm actually provoking you. What it means is to stir up, to excite, or to irritate you in a good sense. Right. In other words, to make you feel uncomfortable. If you need to hear this, you ought to be considering one another. And when you see someone who's not in the right position, you need to provoke them or disturb them or to stir them up or say, come on, brother. Come on, sister. We're not talking about something casual here. We see them in danger. They are relaxed. They have low views of sin or low views of God's house. We ought to stir them. It's not okay to have that attitude. You say, well, that's their responsibility. No, it is not. If you're my brother and walk in here, 
Just like John here, I've never met him before from Indonesia. If he knows the Lord Jesus Christ, he's my brother and I care for him. I don't need to know anything about him, but if he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm gonna exhort him and challenge him and encourage him. I'm gonna look out for him. And I'd hope he'd do the same for me. That, that is what God's people do. You're to provoke. I'm not saying that you go try finding a prophecy for everyone or to go around everyone in every meeting saying, come on, brother. That could actually make you a pain in the, in the head, in the neck. Have you ever had someone who's determined and you're going, just go away and leave me alone. I love Jesus. I'm walking with God. I'm here in God's house. Just leave me alone. I can remember being in meetings where I just came and knelt in front of a church at a big convention, Brother Clonenham preaching, and I'm just there, oh God, deal with my heart, and I just kneel on an altar, and I go, oh God, I know you're dealing with me. And some old pastor who had no more sense come and he starts shaking me and laying his hands, I'm going, God, get rid of this man. <laughs> and starts trying to give me a prophecy. I'm saying, I wish you'd go away. He, he's a pain. But I'm talking about something so, so real here to provoke them onto what? Love yeah. and to good works. If I'm provoking you in the right way, I'm saying, love your brother. But he done this to me. I can't forgive them. Why don't you love them? Mm -hmm. I'm provoking you. You don't like to hear that. I loved it online. A brother from England he said he listened to the message I preached on loving your enemies. And he said, I did not like this message. <laughs> but he says, I know it's true. Amen. That's an example. Yeah. And to good works. Mm -hmm. Let's stand here this morning. Thank you, Lord.